Everybody Hates Rand is a Wheel of Time podcast that will contain spoilers for all 14 books. So if you're anti-spoiler, stop this, read all 14 books, and come back. We'll be here, waiting. Our title is a joke and is meant to be taken as such. Everybody in this context refers to us and our cats. You are free to feel however you want about Rand. He's a fictional character. Please don't DM us. The world is a mess, dark one stretching out his hand. The dragon's reborn, the fire's been fanned, but everybody hates Rand. Everybody hates Rand. Everybody hates Rand. Rand. You guys, Sally's hair looks so cute. She got, got a haircut. haircut. Yeah. For the first time ever. When I do this, I look like Robin Williams and Flubber when I have my glasses pushed what? up. What? <laughs> bangs. You never had. He just has like a very funny, crazy hair. I vaguely remember. Um, or in the poster. I don't know if he actually has it in the movie. I don't remember the movie. Yeah, I don't I don't think I ever saw the movie, but one of our VHSs had a trailer for Flubber yeah. as one of the, you know. Soon to open on di- on video cassette, video cassette or whatever. Yeah. Um, I did indeed cut my hair quite short. That's very cute. Thank you. That's so nice. I just need everyone to you know like refigure your image of Sally for the fan art. <laughs> yeah. Now she has bangs. No, I have bangs. I've got the shag, as everyone is calling it. I the guess. shag. Yeah, that's what this type of hairstyle oh. is technically called a curly shag. Huh. That's cute. Yeah. If you do desire to draw fan art of us in an updated image, there's a picture <laughs> of me on my Twitter. <laughs> so we're getting so many portraits these yeah. days. Yeah. yeah, because people just love to draw us. Yeah. Welcome to Everybody Hates Rand, your friendly neighborhood Wheel of Time podcast. I'm Emily Jushaw. And I'm Sally Goodger. Um, so we are switching over from the city of Abudar to the city of Far Madding, which has probably only been barely mentioned up until this point. Um, not, no, none of our main characters have been there or even really been in the vicinity, but it's a city situated between, um, well, let me check the map real quick, make sure I'm getting it right, between Ilian, Tyr, and Andor. It has like three gates. So, one's the Andor, or the Camelon Gate, one's the Tear Gate, one's the Alien Gate, or whatever. Um, and a lot of what we get in these two chapters is just, like, stuff about farmatting, which I think is kind of... I, I don't totally agree with Robert Jordan introducing a new setting and making such a big deal out of it this late in the series, because we never go back to farmatting. Yeah, we also do not spend a very large amount of time there. Yeah, it's just going to be these rand and peripheral points of view in the second half of this book, which, you know, is half a dozen, seven or eight chapters. Um, So, like... mm, I know, it's a weird choice, and it's also pretty frustrating, I think, because farmatting is quite interesting. Like, I think it adds... um, to some of the, like, thematic and, like, world-building stuff going on. Like, Farmatting is an island city sort of situated in the middle of a lake, which makes it mirror Tarvalon, an island also in the middle of a body of water. In fact, I was just going to mention this, we have made, m- many jokes have been made about the fact that the map of Tarvalon looks like <laughs> a, a diagram of a, of a vagina and labia. The same can be said for farmatting, although, and this is not to um, body shame anyone, because of course no one's vagina looks exactly like the Tarvalon map. Yeah. And probably no one's vagina looks like this either. Yeah. But there is a definite, like, crookedness Mm. to this um, particular, uh, how shall we say, yonic um, map. No, that's such a good point. Tarvalon is very, very neat. Yes. And tidy. It's exactly like the diagram you'd see in a gynecologist's office. Yeah. Where, yeah, yeah, formatting is, like, it's at a little bit of an angle. It's quite not quite, not quite such, like, straight lines. Mm-hmm. Which I, I mean, it's a lot, it's rich for discourse. I think it tells you everything you need to know about <laughs> what Robert Jordan thinks of formatting. Yes. Um, so, 
formatting and it mirror it like is a uh, if you can consider cities to be foils it is a foil of tarvalon in many ways um they are both uh, keeping on my train of thought here for a second they're both island cities in the middle of a body of water tarvalon is the center of channeling female channeling in far matting they have um terangriel that forbids that prevents anyone male or female from channeling so it's this sort of like dead zone yeah steading effect um and uh they've also got they're both quote-unquote matriarchal societies <clears throat> it is somehow even more intense in farmatting than what you see in Tarvalon. It is taking very much a, uh, I don't know, I think it's like taking it very much to the extreme. Like men do not have basically any political or social rights in farmatting or financial rights. Yeah, you would call this more militant matriarchy. Yeah. And just because it deserves being said once again, but we have posited, we have made the argument before that Robert Jordan's matriarchal societies cannot actually be matriarchies because they exist in a fully patriarchal society. The Wheel of Time generally is a patriarchal text yes. and a patriarchal world. Mm -hmm. So these little one-offs of quote-unquote matriarchy are still not exactly what a matriarchy would look like in a vacuum of patriarchy. No, no, abso absolutely not. In fact, they reek of patriarchy coming from a man who um, is positing what a what a society would look like with women in position of power in the position of power yeah and seemingly arguing against it yeah being like women are the just the worst these crooked yeah. vaginas out here just the worst <laughs> great band name. Yeah, crooked vaginas is a great band name you guys can have that one for free yeah. take that to the bank um, so anyway that's the that's some of the thematic stuff going on with farmatting yeah farmatting is also a pacifist um community yes which is i think one of the more interesting aspects about it yes and i'm not quite sure what to make of it in terms of everything else that's going on with it yeah. it seems like there are two very separate things going yeah. on here the pacifism and the like anti-channeling matriarchy um the deal is that you can't have a weapon in mm -hmm. formatting besides like the typical belt knife that everyone carries for basically like having a Swiss army knife. Yeah. Um, when you enter the city, uh, you, and if you own a sword, you are either required to surrender your sword. Coat check it. At the gates. Yeah. And pick it up when you leave or um, have it. Peace bonded. Peace bonded, which uh, we see happening is just like someone putting a bunch of wire around the um, hilt and scabbard of the sword so that you can't draw it. Yes. And unfortunately, unfortunately, I feel like we would be remiss if we did not comment on... Yes. <laughs> the phallic nature of swords. <laughs> the phallic nature of swords and the fact that they are here being rendered... Um, impotent mm -hmm. it is a form of metaphorical castration yeah as we enter this very uh yonic island yeah so maybe those two things are more connected than <laughs> i'm giving it uh credit for the idea that with women in charge they would enforce a peace um you know because women we're all about we're all about peace. Oh, peace, baby. Meanwhile, Egg is <laughs> well, besieging Tarvalon. The egg other, is like, how do we make nukes? The other vagina city. <laughs> Stop. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, so obviously there are ways, apparently, of getting around the, what is it, peace guarding? Peace bonding. Peace bonding, because Rand has an altercation here wherein a couple of guys have swords, so. <laughs> yeah, Rand is just like, I just very delicately clipped the wire so that it looks like it's still. Yeah. But he just, like, totally has a sword, which is, like, so annoying to me. Sorry, That's bonk. Okay. I just talk, t rip your ear off. It's so annoying because it, it would just be so much more interesting if it was, like, they actually do not have weapons and how are they going to deal with life because these are a group of men who are i mean they all these men can channel but they can't channel in formatting yeah the idea of rand taking refuge not taking refuge in formatting he has deliberately left a trail <laughs> <laughs> like he's you know agatha christie crafting yeah. a murder mystery he's deliberately left a trail to um lead his pursuers to the city of formatting um his pursuers being the rogue Ashaman who attacked him at the end of Path of Daggers. 
<clears throat> um, which includes four guys, I want to say, plus Dashiva. Yeah. Who uh, Rand just counts in their number, not knowing that Dashiva is actually one of the Forsaken <laughs> and a little bit special. There are four. Um, but Rand has deliberately left this trail in the hopes of getting them all to the city and picking them off one by one, um, just sort of eliminating the problem. And apparently he has chosen this uh, particular setting with the idea that it will um, give him an advantage, because although it will level the playing field in terms of um, channeling and, you know, swords, maybe... Even if everyone clips the wires and gets their swords out, you're still in trouble if you get your sword out in public. Yeah. Um, Rand has been... <laughs> what? Sorry, you're in trouble if you get your yeah. sword out in public. <laughs> yeah. Still, to this day. <laughs> public indecency! <gasps> anyway, sorry I'm four years old. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Rand... Um, <laughs> This is so stupid. Rand has been training to kill with his bare hands. I know. Also, Rand has ha- dyed his hair black. I know. He as like so a disguise. Ugly. And he's just like, that's it. That's the disguise. <laughs> and I can, I just have to picture that it is such a bad dye job. And he just yeah. looks like a 14 year old middle school girl. His hair is also shoulder length, apparently, yeah. at this point. Yeah, so full emo. Yeah, he he's really... <laughs> really hot topic chic yeah. in the streets of Farmata. Yeah. Picture him in a uh, Evanescence t-shirt. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, we open with him stalking what's his name? Uh, Rocade. Or Rochade. We've, I think, joked about the fr- French pronunciation of his Rochade. name before. Rochade. Rochade. He is following Rochade and he, his entire point of view reeks of arrogance and yeah. egotism. He's like, this is too easy. Rochade's such an idiot. Only to find out that Rochade is well aware that he is being followed and has like deliberately cornered Rand where he can be attacked by another of yeah. these rogue Ashman. And Rand doesn't really like react to that that we see. Um, you know, he's not like beating himself up over the fact that it was so easy for these guys to corner him. As Min notes later, through the bond, she did not experience any type of emotion coming from Rand that one might expect in a fight for one's life. Yeah, which is extremely unhealthy, Rand, my guy. Which, yeah, if you can't tell, is pretty unhealthy. So is the megalomaniac, you know? being like, I'm gonna kill these people with my bare hands in broad daylight in a city that would imprison and possibly execute me for committing violence in public, but I won't get caught because I'm the Dragon Reborn. I cannot channel my number one superpower in this city that I chose. (laughs) It's a lot, you guys. This might be his most blatantly, like, off the rails, insane thing that he does. And it is so frustrating because no one seems to call him on it. Yeah. And he also doesn't really, like, experience any consequences for it. Yeah, he just is in this city trying to kill the Ashman. There's, like, a big fight. He gets put in a box again. Katsuan rescues him. Then they leave and go cleanse Sidon. Yeah. Well, literally. He's like, that was kind of, farm mining was kind of a wild weekend. He's like, well, that was a bummer. That was a bummer. Yeah, yeah. He really just like, what happens in farm adding stays in farm adding. Yeah. Along with the bodies of all of the Ashman <laughs> who <laughs> killed. Brutally murders in the streets. Um, yeah, I really don't get it. Because like, besides Min's little, oh, you're not feeling anything? That seems like a problem. It's not like Nynaeve and Lan are like, you know, it's not like we're getting points of view from Nynaeve where she's like, you know what, Lan? I really think Rand might be losing it. Yeah, later in this book when he's like finally goes to kill the two like remaining Ashaman or whatever, they basically enable him to do this. Yeah, they're just like, yeah, just go, like, go, yeah go well, if you're going, we have to go with you. It ends poorly. It, Rand in a box. Yeah, cough, Rand cough. In a box. Cough, cough. But like, yeah, it, it just is a little bit weird because Rand progressively from this point forward actually... Rand has already been, every time he interacts with people for the last five books, people have been like, ooh, is he going crazy or whatever? Yeah. And we, the readers, have been in Rand's head and have been kind of, like, well aware that Rand is as sane as a person in his shoes can be. Mm -hmm. So it's always been a little bit ridiculous, you know? There have been these eerie moments, like Matt calling Luce the Rin's name and and Rand Rand responding to it. Yeah. But for the most part, we've been like, Rand is still a rational thinking and feeling protagonist 
um, and everyone else is just sort of, you know, a touch paranoid because this is sort of what's going to happen eventually. But here we're getting for the first time what objectively seems like insane behavior mm -hmm. and no one, nothing. I know, I... It seems like a real missed opportunity for Robert Jordan to be like, hey, you guys, that whole insanity thing, not a joke. Yeah, like, like, let's play with that a little bit more. Especially because we are, like, on the verge of cleansing Sidon, and you can really, like, put a lot of tension into that. Once they cleanse Sidon, is his insanity, such as it is, going to go away, or is he just going to be stuck on this precipice? Yeah. I mean, and I mean, the answer is the latter, but we just aren't really... Robert Jordan is spending so much fucking time talking about how formatting is a matriarchy and describing people's clothes and dresses yeah. and how different it is from other cities that he's not giving us the important details. I know. I also feel like it's such a, like, formatting for all of its ridiculousness is like a really rich setting in like the terms of the wheelie time world for Rand's behavior to be like... Like, I, I don't know, I almost want it to be, like, nobody's commenting on it because this is, like, such peak toxic masculinity behavior that it doesn't seem that out of place. Mm -hmm. To be like, yes, I'm going to commit violence in broad daylight. Obviously, I'm going to win and I'm not going to have any feelings. Yeah. And so it just, like, I almost want someone, I, I don't know, it just feels like there's a lot of potential for people to be like, oh, we're commenting on your behavior now because it's really strange. Or being like, well, this is just how men behave. Yeah. Like, there's, there was a possibility to go, like, either of those two ways and have it been really interesting, but they're just, like, n it goes, passes by without any comment is, like, why, Robert? Like, you had such a moment here. Yeah, so somehow Robert Jordan has set up what could be a crucially interesting plot yeah. point, and I forget that this happens all the <laughs> yeah, time. I do. <laughs> Completely forget formatting. Winter's Heart, I think, Cleansing of Sidon, Rand Sleeps with Elaine, nothing in between. Yeah. You know? Who, Matt escapes Abudar. Matt escapes Abudar. Like, Fail gets kidnapped. Who remembers this whole plot point in formatting? As wild as it is, I know it should be one of the top moments yeah. in Winter's Heart. But Robert Jordan just totally whiffed it. Yeah, it's like doop 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 boop a doop a doop. Rand kills a man with his bare hands. Wow, he's like the guy in the Matrix. Neo. Yeah, when he learns kung fu for the first time. Oh, I haven't seen the Matrix all the way through. I don't get, like, I can appreciate The Matrix, but I feel like that's one of those things that I maybe, I miss the nostalgia factor yeah. of it. Like, I just, I just I don't fully get it. Maybe, maybe John Wick is a better Keanu reference in this instance. John Wick could kill anyone with his, yeah, Rand is having a real John Wick moment <laughs> yeah. here. And it's like, your dog didn't even die, man. Yeah. You and just like, got attacked. You always get attacked. I don't know what the big deal is. Yeah. And John Wick wouldn't have had this level of megalomania. It's just grounded confidence. Yeah. He's the Baba Yaga. <laughs> Rand is like, look at me. Look at me. I'm the Baba Yaga. <laughs> and Rashid is like, what the fuck, man? Yeah, Rashid's like, are you good? Are you okay? I mean, Roche isn't saying anything because his windpipe has been crushed by... Yeah, by Rand's bare hands. Yeah, Jesus, just the... Give the him the chop. chop. So Rand is stalking Roche and eventually corners him, he thinks, in this alley. <laughs> yeah, it's got a little bit of a comedic factor, almost Princess Diary style. Yeah. Like, no, you picked the cup you thought had the poison. <laughs> Princess Bride. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> That would be quite a different I was movie. I to say how that related to Princess Diaries. <laughs> no, it would be like, quite oh. a movie if Julie Andrews was like, you picked the cup that you thought had the poison in no, it. No, there are two cups before you. One of them has deadly poison in it. <laughs> yeah. No, no, there's an alleyway before you. And Anne Hathaway is like, what you didn't know is that I've developed an alleyway. <laughs> <laughs> Immunity to Iocane powder. Exactly. Quite a twist for the Princess Diaries. But yes, I mean the Princess Bride. And the Princess Briaries. Um... <laughs> So, uh, Roshade's like, wow, you idiot. I can't yeah. believe you really thought that you... You cornered me. You cornered me. And Rand just, like, <laughs> karate chops him in the throat before he can even get his sword all the way out. Yeah. And Roshade goes down like... <laughs> <laughs> Only for, uh, Kisman to come up behind Rand and try and attack him. Um, Rand dodges out of the way and Kisman stabs Roshade. So it's a real comedy of errors. Yeah. Rand wasn't actually the one who killed this guy. 
it was Kisman, his accomplice. Um, and before they can fight Rand and Kisman, they hear the sound of guards coming, and Kisman is like, if they catch us, we will both, you know, be going straight to Jail. 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 The Aiel. Like, yeah. <laughs> and Rand is like, all right, fair enough. And they part ways, two enemies, you know, just to like meet John another Wick. day. Yeah, exactly. Just like John Wick, where, you know, at the, once you get to the hotel, the special hotel, you have to stop fighting. Yeah. Until John Wick 3. Or John Wick 2. I think it's the end of John Wick 2, and then John Wick 3 is the, like, all the rules are fake now. Yeah. We have to reestablish safe havens for assassins. John Wick 4 is coming out soon, (gasps) baby. John Wick 4. I'm so excited. That'd be a fun one to go see in the drive-in with Devin and Janet. I'll see it in a real theater. If I saw Jujutsu Kaisen's You're episode so right, zero, Bessie. I'll see Keanu. I'll just have to wait a couple weeks. Yeah, the two most <clears> important men in our thing. life. Keanu and Gojo. <laughs> Stop, not Gojo. I'll kill you. <laughs> Utah, obviously. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm How s- dare you I'm put s- Gojo's name in the same <laughs> sentence as Keanu? Speaking of megalomaniacs. Yeah, Gojo wishes he was Keanu. <laughs> man oh what a bastard okay so rand runs off kisman runs off kisman we switch to his point of view as he um walks away and immediately gets poisoned (laughs) yeah he gets stabbed with a poison dagger or some shit Yeah, he like feels a cut and then someone says he belongs to me and then fades into the mist yeah and kisman basically keels over dead immediately um we will find out at the end of this chapter that that was Luke slash Isam, who, again, we have not seen in many, many books <laughs> since book four, I believe. Another book four, four plot revitalizing in book nine. Yeah, and he appe- appears here basically just to take credit for every unsolved murder that has happened in the series thus far. Except for the random stabbing of that Aes Sedai woman that kicked off <laughs> yeah. events in Lord of Chaos. That was not Luke slash Isam. That was put on fame. Basically, at this point, if there's some like weird shit where someone gets stabbed or killed or assassinated or whatever, you can say to yourself, well, it's either Luke East or Isam, Luke and Isam or put on fame. And really, there's no substantive difference between the two of them. Yeah, They're both just sort of like these free agent evil characters running around who sometimes want to kill Rand and sometimes don't. It's quite confusing. It's pretty confusing and, like, pretty clearly just sort of, like, Robert Jordan being like, sometimes I need a threat. Yeah. It's like plot cleanup. Lazy plot cleanup. Lazy plot cleanup. And, like, (laughs) yeah, it seems like after book three, he was like, well, I can't just throw Trollocks or Grey Men at Rand and his allies whenever I need an exciting moment of conflict. So I guess I have to throw in Luke or Padon Fane. And we're like, that doesn't make any more sense than Trollocks randomly appearing. Yeah. In fact, it makes less sense because the Trollocks, we are led to believe, are not really rational creatures. Yeah. Luke slash Isam, there's something in there. There's a brain. So he should have motives that make sense on some level. Yeah. But he doesn't. He just likes killing. He does explicitly refer to Rand, though, as his nephew here, which is, I guess, the first time that's happened. Um, but yeah, he's basically like, um, yeah, a bunch of the Forsaken- oh, no, wait, that was Kisman. (laughs) Yeah! Kisman was like, so, here's what happened. We're trying to kill Rand. The male, aka Mazram Tem, was like, yeah, for sure, kill him. Which, I don't know if that's our first- blatant indication that Mazram Tem is evil, but, like, if you missed it up until this point, then there's no hope for you. <laughs> I don't have to tell you. Um, kill him, Demondred had commanded later, which I guess is Robert Jordan finally committing to the fact that Mazram, uh, Mazram Tem and Demondred are Separate not the same people. people. Unless this was a red herring, and <laughs> Demondred and are the same person. Yeah, and they just both separately were like, hey, you're such an idiot, I have to tell you twice. Gotta make sure you know. In separate guises. Yeah. And then later, Moradin also was like, yeah, you can kill him, but above all, bring everything in his possession to me. Which, I think Moradin is after the Choden call. So, 
lots of lots of forsaken going on here. Luke slash Isam is answering to we don't know who. It is a a man who is in disguise doing something with the power so that Luke can't like see him directly or something. And it's like at this point we're down to Mazrum Tem, Demondred, and Morden, I believe. Oh, and I guess Dashiva in terms of male yeah. forsaken and Dashiva's about to bite it, so <laughs> And at this point, there's really no, there's, the differences between those three are negligible. Because, yep. as we know, Demondra and Demazer and Tim are the same person. Correct. And Morden and Demondred are on the same side doing essentially the same things. Yeah. So, it doesn't really matter. Nothing that Luke is doing really matters. Which seems like another missed opportunity on Robert Jordan's part, because Luke slash Isam is such an aberration in this world. Like, aberration, excuse yeah. me. Like, what a fascinating and weird thing that went on. Why does it just, like, float around in the background instead of being like, here's a weird thing that happened that's going to be a central plot point of some sort? Yeah, you might as well have not told us who killed Kismet. It would have made about as much difference. Yeah. Um... I am a little bit frustrated that Kismen got killed by um, Luke slash Isam because, I don't know, as much as I think what Rand's doing here is stupid, and like you said, toxic masculinity, he's still the protagonist, and I kind of want him to succeed at his goals. I know. So, it's... like, in a Kill Bill way, there's a satisfaction in him, like, the idea of him, like, hunting down these guys who betrayed him. Yeah. Even though it was pretty fucking obvious that they were never on his side. You know, it's stupid, but it would have been nice if he actually succeeded in killing yeah. any of these guys. But, in fact, I don't think he does. He is not the one, really, who kills Rochade. That was an accident. Friendly mm -hmm. fire. He's not the one who kills Kismen. I don't even know if he knows that Kismen is dead. I don't think so. The other two, um, Gedwin and Torval. Torval and Gedwin, I think they survived this. <laughs> I don't think, like, I think they're still around. And obviously Dashiba, so... No, and it's like, if Ran doesn't kill any of them... Then it, what's the point? Then why does farmatting happen at all? Exactly. Like, it's really... The more we talk about it, the more I'm like, this whole city and this whole sequence of events is so unanchored from everything else that happens. It feels like page filler. Yeah. Which, in a series as long as Wheel of Time that could have been cut down so much, feels so ridiculous. Yeah. Why did we need page filler? Of all the things. Yeah, Rand could have just gone directly from the like, beginning of this book, or sleeping with Elaine or whatever, to going to cleansing Sidon. Yeah, we could have used these pages to go back to Perrin and progress that plot a little further. Yeah. So that we weren't languishing with Perrin's plot for the next two weeks. Oh, languishing is correct. <sighs> Boy, you guys. It's real frustrating. It is just really, it is really weird. Anyway, Rand... After this altercation goes back to the inn where he's staying with the others, which means Min, Nynaeve, and Lan, and I don't know if we reference this, when Nynaeve disappeared from the palace and came Lin, basically just leaving a note, because I don't know, she was like, I'm on a secret mission, but also she is conflict avoidant, weirdly enough. Mm -hmm. But um, she brought Olivia with her for some reason. I can't remember the context. I don't know if it's ever explained. Really. I think maybe Olivia just insisted on going along. Yeah. Or, or maybe Nynaeve wanted to keep an eye on her or something. There's a sort of, like, competitiveness between Nynaeve and Olivia. Nynaeve is outfitted in all of these, like, Angriel, Cyangriel jewelry mm -hmm. things. Like, she's got a cool bracelet that's connected to rings yeah. setup thing. Which Rand notices and is just like, wow... Nynaeve's getting real materialistic these days. And it's like, okay, you don't have room to talk, first of all. Yeah. But also, yeah, they're clearly angry, you know? Yeah. Uh, Cat Swan, we'll talk about it later, but they call them, like, wells or something like that. They are specific types of terangreal that let you, like, store the one power in them in order to draw upon it later. So, like, this allows them to channel a little bit while in format. Yeah, Cad's one and my knave are yeah. the only two who can yeah. do that. Um, But, yeah, he comes back and is like, well, I just killed one. He didn't. And ran had a run-in with the other one, which means there might be more of them in the city than I originally thought, so we've got to, you know, pack up and move in. And everyone's like... 
great and goes to do that. I don't really think anything substantive happens. It's just the usual, you know. Blah, blah, blah. Isn't it so funny when women are in charge and are mean to men? Yeah, and Rand being like, Nynaeve is insane. And no one being like, Rand, you're insane. You're insane. Did you have anything else you wanted to add about Nynaeve and Olivia being competitive with each other? No, I think I just... Cut your thought I think I just... That was it. Nynaeve Mm -hmm. is clearly wary of Olivia. Yeah. So is Min. I don't think Min has... Or has she? I don't think Min has had the viewing yet that Olivia is going to, quote, help Rand die. Hmm. But she does have that viewing later, and then she hates Olivia's guts. I, as interesting a character as I find Olivia, I also think she is not serving much of a function, either here or elsewhere in the series. Especially for someone who is attached to such an important prophecy as well, being involved in Rand's death at all. Yeah, and Olivia is also, up to this point, really the, like, one... Shanchen character we see that is so deeply anti the Shanchen Empire. This is the same character, right, Olivia? Yeah, was Olivia a Demon. was a Demon for many, many years. She's very old. Yeah. Um, and she has been successfully deprogrammed, or successfully, as we who have read the entire series know, because Olivia never betrays anyone, but some characters like Nynaeve are still wary. Yeah, and it's like that is to me, a person who is very anti the Shanshan having any points of view at all, Olivia is the Shanshan character that would be of most value and interest to give more depth and points of view to. Yeah. As someone who's like, what am I going to do to take down this horrific imperialist force? But instead, she's just another woman for our main female characters to hate. Yeah, it so. seems more really like she's just added to Ram's coterie the way that he is adding representatives from every major culture yeah. into his coterie. He usually has some ale around. He usually, at this point, he's going to start having sea folk people around mm-hmm. at random. Mm-hmm. Um, now he's got a random Shanshan woman, and it's just like to just emphasize his world conqueror-ness and the idea that he has to work with all of these cultures in order to get anything done which is as we have said many times um a gross point when it comes to the shanshan yeah yeah but speaking of the sea folk we switch (laughs) points of view over to uh shalon that's how i'm going to say her name who is a wind finder with the sea folk um there's a big sea folk just like recap there's a big sea folk ship in kyrian that's just been anchored in the river um, in the last book, some of the Aes Sedai succeeded in creating a bargain with the Sea Folk, which they started out on pretty good terms because Rand was there doing Tavir and stuff. But then he left randomly, leaving the Aes Sedai alone, and so now there's a more equitable bargain, I would argue. Um, but, like, one part of the bargain that concerns Harine, who is the main lady as well as Shallan's younger sister, um, is that she should be allowed to, like, be near Rand, part of his coterie as well. Or I guess in her point of view, he'd be part of her coterie. Yeah. She's collecting the Dragon Reborn, not the other way around. Um, so she's, like, constantly making these demands to see Rand. And for some godforsaken reason, Katsuan has gone along with this. Katsuan has never, in our experience, you know allowed people to do what they want or been like i'm going to compromise or do whatever you know i don't know why she's allowing the sea folk to go with her here it makes zero sense but she does for some reason i know another part of formatting that's really weird and frustrating is like in a series that is kind of so insistent on showing us all the steps between point a and point b like we get so much talking about traveling and so much traveling and so much discussion of destinations even when it's like shrouded in mystery like the fake out with Ilian at the end of um crown of swords there's like absolutely no connection between the last time we saw cad swan at the beginning of this book and then her coming to farm adding there's like no connective tissue there i think yeah, I agree that there is not enough blatant connective to. I mean, like, I know she's going after Rand. Da, 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 right. But it's not, like, as explicit as it normally is. Yeah. Normally we would get, like, a whole planning yeah. stage 
here we are in Shallan's point of view, so we're not even in a character's point of view who can have, like, a little sentence like, and eventually Kad Swan realized that Alana can pinpoint on a map where yep. Rand is, and we can go to there, you know? Mm-hmm. We don't even get that, so we're just kind of left to uh, make those intuitive leaps ourselves. Which generally is fine if you are not coddling your reader, uh, but Robert Jordan has a habit of coddling his readers. Yeah, and it just makes it feel like, <laughs> it feels like a wild swing to the other end of the pendulum where I'm not given enough information for So yeah, once. Robert Jordan is either not giving us enough information or giving us way too much information. Yeah, and it's like, you can settle in the middle here. Like, I, I personally am an idiot, but the reader generally as a concept can put this together and know what's going on. You don't have to spoon feed us information, but you do need to like set the table for us. Yeah. Here it is. The plot. Yeah. So, but we are in Shallan's point of view. Shallan, for reference, is the sea folk woman that Rand tied up at the end of yeah, Crown of Swords. At the end of Path of Daggers Sorry, when of the Daggers. rogue Ashman were attacking. He walked into a room and found Shallan and Aleel, who's a Kyrianan woman, um, in the same room. Not like in flagrante or anything, but in this book, I guess, Kadzuan or someone, we've been told that Shallan and Aleel were having an affair. And we referenced earlier that Kat Swan would be blackmailing both of them into compliance with this affair, which is, of course, very annoying because it's just queer women getting punished for being queer. Um, so Shallan has that hanging over her head. Yeah. Um, R.I.P. And which is basically why she's going along with anything. Although, of course, Harine is in charge, so she just sort of has to do what Harine says. Um... And nothing, like, major happens in Shallan's point of view. They travel outside of the city. They go into the city, which is where we sort of get our explicit um, explanation of the Terra Angreal and the steading effect. Um, and they enter the city, which is where we get the explanation of the peace bonding and the pacifism of the city. And then that's it. That's where we leave that point of view. Um, so the bulk of Shallan's point of view in this is just sort of running down the roster of who is here. The million and a half Aes Sedai who are following in either Cad Suan's wake or Rand's, and Shallan as an outsider sort of interpreting those various groups and not understanding. Um, and I don't know, the thing that struck me most was that this is what feels like our first sea folk point of view. Mm. Um, and it is reminiscent to me of some ale points of view that we've had previously. We've noted that in the very, the relatively few points of view that we get from the ale, usually Avienda, Robert Jordan has a habit of um, making them seem stupid. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, he is trying to show us cultural differences. If we're, if we're giving him the benefit of the doubt here, he is just trying to show us that cultures are different, but then what he is doing is making Avienda and here Shalon seem like an idiot. Yeah. You know, like, they're always afraid of horses, and they can't ride, which, like, of course, yeah, Shalon probably can't ride, but you don't need to, like, be reminding us of it every minute. Yeah, it's also, like, she I- doesn't know what the word clearing is. I'm also so annoyed with Robert Jordan's, like, obsession with the fact that the ale and the sea folk can't ride horses. Like, yes, being an experienced rider is one thing, but just, like, getting on a horse and riding it is not an extremely difficult thing. Yeah, I could do it when I was seven. Yeah, like, it's not like, okay, maybe they're not going to be the best riders in the world. They're not going to be able to chase someone down on horseback, but they're going to be able to, like, sit in a saddle. It feels like one of his ways by which he humiliates women, because there are no men characters who have a trouble riding. Yeah. Um, If the men, like, you know, we never see Gaul on a horse. I don't believe he just runs alongside or loyal carries him bridal style. <laughs> but like um, a lot of our most insufferable female characters, including a lot of the sea folk and like Swan mm-hmm. have trouble writing. So it's just sort of Robert Jordan being like, oh, here's a way to quote humanize them, which in Robert Jordan speak means humiliate them. I don't know why I'm, like, so deep in this type of discourse today, but I also think there could be something to be said with the fact that Shallan is a canonically queer woman. Avienda and Swan are deeply queer-coded women. Mm-hmm. And the fact that they have trouble writing yeah. is certainly something, isn't it? 
Um, yeah, it sure feels that way. We're, we also get an allusion here, by the way, to um, apparently Kat Swan in her last scene was like, spank the spank Kareen if she misbehaves to one of the Aes Sedai, oh, yeah. and apparently that Aes Sedai, Serene, went through on that threat if um, Harine's behavior is at all indicative, which is just yet another example of Robert Drum being like, <laughs> isn't it funny when women get spanked? Especially when they're doing it to each other. Oh my god. It's so titillating. It's so so sexy. Especially because Serene is canonically one of our most beautiful characters. Who doesn't know she's beautiful? <laughs> and also, you know, I don't know. I sort of think Serene would be an interesting character um, to do a reading of her being on the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't believe that's what Robert Jordan's intent was. No, 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 no. I think if I you brought your either. best reading intentions to this, you could be like, oh, here's someone who has Asperger's or is on the spectrum. Um, not because she's hyper-rational or anything like that. That's just sort of the way she behaves around other people. Sorry, I'm not trying to make stereotypes. No, but I, I think I think you're making valid points. Um, but Robert Jordan, I seriously doubt had that in mind. He just sort of wanted to make Serene look awkward and incapable of social interaction or understanding social currents. Yeah, no, I don't know if I'm going to totally make this bridge, but I think with a lot of the white Aja, which I believe Serene is yes, part the, of. Yes, the logical. There people. is that, like, hyper-rationalization that Robert Jordan is playing into, which happens to be equated with stereotypes of people who have autism. Um, and so I think... Robert Jordan is perhaps unintentionally, but still playing into those stereotypes. So when he's presenting characters like this, you get a lot of really destructive stereotypes around that. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not, I don't know if I'm quite getting at my point here, but it feels like something that is a destructive representation without even like, being representation. Yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. But yeah, those are, those are the main points. Shalon doesn't like not being able to channel She's like, it's fine at first, and then by the end she's having a meltdown. So, um, I don't know. Women are unstable and emotional. What do you want? She's probably on her period. <laughs> Some of the Ashaman are also with us. Some of the Ashaman are also with us because they have been bonded as warders. So, doopadoo, Dammer Flynn, Nourishma, and mm -hmm. Eben. Nourishma, my beloved. Dammer yeah. Flynn, my beloved. Eben. Who, who I don't really feel anything about. Yeah, I'm like, He's hi. just sort of there. You're... Spoiler alert, he dies at the end of this book. So. Yeah. Doesn't do much. So, we're just losing Ashman one after one after one. Um, but that's, I guess, it from Farmatting for now. Farmatting, by the way, is a reference to the title of the Thomas Hardy novel, Far From the Matting Crowd, which itself comes from a poem called Elegy in a Church Courtyard or something. It's a very long poem. I remember seeing it in a an English uh, textbook when I was in high school and still really into Wheel of Time and being like, that looks familiar. Far from the what now? Far from the what? Um, and I don't, I don't have any further comment on that except that Robert Jordan was pulling from literature. I don't know thematically what either of those works really... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever read any Thomas Hardy. I wouldn't. Seems pretty boring. <laughs> I mean, he wrote Tess of the Durbervilles, right? Yeah. And that's like Anastasia Steele's favorite book in Fifty Shades of Grey, so I like Boy, cannot yeah, bring don't, myself don't trust to read it. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that is interesting. I did not I had no idea. I thought Farmatting was just like a fun name, so no, yeah, and again I don't really know thematically if it means anything or um or if it does what it means, but it's there. You know, I guess you're welcome to tell us. That's it, though. Do you have anything to add? No. Excuse me. Okie dokie. No, I've said enough. Um, then we'll leave there. Um, thanks to Glenn McKenzie for our theme song. Thank you to our patrons on Patreon and our followers on social media. Um, we're gonna be taking an off week next week just because Sally's out of town, so we won't have a chance to record. Yeah. Um, but we'll be back two weeks from today if you're listening to this on the Monday that it's released. Uh, back with more formatting content. 
Straight from winter's fart. Straight from winter's fart. I guess my sign off is that a fly did indeed get into our house today because a maintenance guy had to come and paint something. Um, and for fully like an hour and a half, it was driving Tibble absolutely bananas, which happens every time he spots an insect, but yeah. um, it was... <laughs> really killing me he like eventually had it cornered in oh, one of the windows no. and kept swatting it and i kept thinking that he had actually successfully like grabbed it <laughs> yeah in his little paw and i'd like get up because i was afraid he was gonna eat it and eventually i just put the poor fly out of its misery because i felt like he was being tormented tormented by this <laughs> giant creature i didn't have a fly swatter so i had to use an agatha christie novel <laughs> Now I have a fly swatter. I went out and bought. <laughs> Emily's like, never again, Agatha. Yeah, poor Agatha. Um, that's it. Not very exciting, but it's, it's like summer is starting, I guess. Tibble a history with insects. First, the cricket that he mysteriously oh God, brought yeah. upstairs, the fly that he was tormenting. He really is a terror to. Yeah, to the whole insect population. Yeah. They're they're gonna tell tales of him. <laughs> the monster, the monster, beast. the beast of Javudan. The That's beast Tibble. of Javudan. Okay, everyone. Goodbye. Teen Wolf movie. <laughs> oh, I forgot about the Teen Wolf movie. <laughs> Bye. Bye.